Should we do that again? I forgot my name. Sure. <laughs> you did? Yeah, I panicked. <laughs> Sure, go this for it. This is a it. tough one. Yeah. This is a tough one. Harry, Beth, Her, Sean, me. Okay. You go for it. Okay, these two are as insightful as they are adorable. Carrie Beth McGarry, the owner of Nine the Gallery, and her husband, Sean McGarry, the sales director of Nine the Gallery, one of the coolest galleries here in Phoenix, Arizona, have some amazing things to say about what it takes to become a professional artist and how you can bump up the game so you can become a professional in your field, what they look for in artists when they're looking to work with new people, as well as some amazing and insightful words about fear and creativity. They also have an adorable story about how they met. Stick around. Hi creators, my name is Sky Lucking. I'm an artist and muralist here in Phoenix, Arizona and the host of Courageous Creatives, the YouTube channel that elevates you to your highest self using inspiration, education, courage building, and community. Today is Who's Who Arizona Wahoo, where I interview the movers and shakers in the creative industries of Arizona. And I'm so excited for my guests today, Carrie Beth and Sean McGarry, the owners and operators of Nine the Gallery, one of my favorite galleries here in the city. If you're interested in what's happening in the creative landscape of Arizona, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell notification so you never miss a video. I am always setting up interviews with some of the most interesting, interesting people in Arizona, and you'll see those right here. I was fortunate enough to work with Carrie Beth and Sean on the Decked show. I was one of the artists who designed one of the 50 custom designed skateboards for the deck show. I also did a time lapse video of some of these skateboards being designed, and you can see that right here. They always have something super cool going on. I sat down with them to talk a little bit about the gallery itself, where they see it going, and how they operate it. Also, what they look for in artists when they're looking to work with new people, as well as their thoughts on fear and creativity. And it is poignant and insightful and really beautifully said. Let's check it out. High school. So I was a sophomore in high school. And I was a freshman. She's a freshman and we were in Anything goes. Yeah, in high school, and I'll never forget I had the biggest crush on her in the And I did too. I had the biggest crush on him, and we were partnered together, and at the end we were like married. Uh huh. Yeah. And that's how it all started. Exactly, and I, she was obviously way too cool for me for the entire span of high school. So we were friends, but I never went and like asked her out or anything like that because she's like the coolest. And then um, fast forward, years and years forward, separate careers, separate everything, and then we reconnected. Um, reconnected. I sent her a message on Facebook, believe it or not, saying I was going to be back in Buffalo where she lived or from. And um, we crashed a wedding together and crashed the wedding. Yeah, exactly. We've been together it. ever since. Yeah, right? The, uh, the butterflies were gone when I finally asked. <laughs> so <laughs> you just don't know. My name is Carrie Beth McGarry, I'm the owner of Nine the Gallery. And I am Sean McGarry, the sales director of Nine the Gallery. So Nine the Gallery was founded back in 2012 by Laura Dragon. The gallery's been here for about six years now, and over that time it's just grown and grown. And then we got involved with the gallery when, uh, with the addition of the Nine Collective back in September of 2017. We joined uh, the collective and started working closely with Laura. Um, as a lot of people in the community know, Laura was uh, unfortunately diagnosed with stage four cancer back in April of 2017. And so in January of this year, she approached us and asked us if we would be interested in taking over uh, the gallery from her so she could kind of focus on just living her life 
and not have to be burdened with all those day-to-day -day tasks of spreadsheets and contracts and whatnot. And so it was a dream of ours to take over and run a gallery someday. So we jumped at the opportunity and it's been a great, great ride ever since. What we're trying to do here as gallery owners, we're not in it for the, the glory because we're working 24 hours a day on this, yeah. but we do it because we love it and we're passionate about it and we want to, we both have a deep passion for helping artists, helping them succeed, helping them brand themselves, helping them brand their shows, helping them de develop cohesive bodies of work. We want to break away from the mold that are like the, 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 what's been going on where you know gallery owners just call up the artists and say, hey, what do you have? What do you have in your closet? I need an artist for next month. Can you bring your stuff? And that's what we want to step away from. And we really want to start working with artists and helping to, to educate them and just realize that it takes a village to, to do this. And this area has been overlooked. Yes. It's always been over. Um, yeah. There's there's more than enough talent here that this is there are enough artists that can be full time artists and do really well for themselves. We just have to figure out how. And we actually started in the collective like as is an artist team actually under the, the name Fun Walk. So that's how that's kinda of tied into everything too. Kind of come from this position from like the entry road of actually artists, so we kind of know both sides of it, which gives perspective to the gallery position. Because my background is in arts management, I got my master's degree in arts management, and used to teach uh, with a graduate program in arts management over at the University of Buffalo, and then to also have that artistic background and working with you as a partner for the last five years together as an artistic team, it kind of seemed like a natural fit. FunWow was started uh, as kind of just a, a it's just, well, it actually had to get started because um, we submitted a, uh, a design for Global Inheritance, uh, which is a um, non for profit that works for the Coachella Music and Arts Festival. And they commission artists to create recycling bins that um, are really unique and cool that they eventually donate to schools. but. For the first run after they're made, they're actually displayed on the grounds of Coachella Music and Arts Festival. We, on a whim, submitted yeah. and happened to be accepted. And so uh, it was a huge jump for us because we had just been painting pretty much for ourselves and our family at that point. And when we, uh, when we were filling out the paperwork, we couldn't be, uh, we could be a team, but we couldn't submit both of our names. So the bin would either have to be listed under one of our names, which wasn't going to work for us. And so we, I went to him and said, what do we have? And he said, fun wow. I said, yeah. perfect. Which so is, he's the fun, I'm the wow. From there it just kind of fit. Yeah, we've been working with Global Inheritance and the Coachella Music and Arts Festival for three years now. And yeah, started establishing ourselves in the Phoenix arts scene at the same time. So Yeah, you just never know. What do we look for in artists? Primarily, um, we look for drive. It's something that you can't teach, and it's something that is either there or not there. So those those intangibles are really important. That that's going to be a big differentiation between who to work with and you know who's really not ready. I mean, we also look for obviously we look for composition. Uh, for me, execution is a, a big one, um, but we also want someone who is open to being guided uh, because believe it or not creating a work of art a, a body of work or a branded body of work and building a branded artist is not a solo endeavor it it's a group effort and that's the approach that we take with our artists is when we're looking to put out a show we like to sit down with them six months eight months in advance of their show and ask them what are you what do you have to say? What do you want to say next? Where do you see yourself going? And then kind of working with them over the span of that time to create a branded body of work that's cohesive, that will be recognized years into the future 
by by other you know by viewers that that work came from that specific series by that specific artist, and so a willingness and an ability for an artist to be open to that sort of guidance and working in a collaborative effort like that is also something a big big key factor for us. For sure, um, I think self awareness of style too. So sometimes people don't really understand maybe where they fit in the spectrum of art, you know, where where they kind of fit. And having a self-awareness of where their best fit or even maybe kind of a range, I think that's important. It gives a self-awareness for what you're doing mm -hmm. to be able to kind of focus. And um, I also think professionalism, you know, people that know how to answer an email, <sighs> just not to be unprofessional. That meet deadlines, yeah. that come pick up their work. Pick up is as important as drop off, <laughs> believe it or not. Just an artist that, that really takes their craft seriously in terms of how they're going to manage themselves as well. Common mistakes that artists make in their work or career. One of the biggest mistakes that we've seen artists make, and really subconsciously, is the failure to take their artistic career and run it like a business. Yeah, just because you make something doesn't really mean that someone's out there is going to buy it or even discover it. Just because it's made, that, that's not the end of the story. It's a very um, kind of mantra out here that being good isn't good enough. So that means, you know, treating it like a business. How are you going to market yourself? How are you going to brand yourself? What is your target market? You know, understanding where they are differentiated in the market, in the scene. These are tough soul-searching questions, and that's why a lot of people don't do it, because it takes time. These are things like any business book you'll ever read, is that page one of book one, lesson one of marketing, is what's your target market? And that takes a lot of self-knowledge. It takes a lot of soul-searching to know this stuff, so a lot of people would rather paint or create something than really do the soul-searching part of that. That's a big mistake. I also like to, to just remind artists that no one is going to knock on your door and know what you're creating inside your apartment, inside your studio, inside your home. We encourage artists to submit. We actually love going through submissions and we go through every single submission that comes across our desk. We look at that, we look at the artist, we look at their potential. And so that's the way, like if you want, if you're creating, you need to take that leap and put yourself out there. But I would say for me, another uh, mistake that I see a lot of artists make is not not finishing their work. And that can that means a lot of different things, so let me kind of explain. Sometimes it's still an unfinished thought where the composition is almost there but not quite. Um, sometimes it's a matter of the execution and the cleanliness of the execution. Sometimes the idea has to you know, emerge on the canvas or in the sculpture, but the attention to the details of just finishing, just taking that extra day, two days, and going in and looking at the fine details of the work and making sure those are completed. And then also the presentation of the work itself. If it's a matted piece, mat it and frame it properly. You can't have a beautiful work and then put it in a dollar store frame. You have to, that the framing and the matting and the presentation of your work is as much a part of the work as the work itself. So how you, how you showcase your art says a lot about you and says a lot about your brand and about your value as an artist. Couldn't say that better. So. Nice. When you speak with collectors, what do you notice they're looking for? Ooh, collectors. Collectors are looking for value. They they're investors. They're investors. So they're they're investors. For something that is going to have inherent value and will continue to grow value. That's a big thing to understand, and that's why these little things are so important. Well, they are also. I, I agree 100% that value is. I mean, it's it's like you invest in stocks. They they're investing in an artist. They don't want to see that artist disappear in six months or 12 months or three years. They're making an investment into the artist and the work, and that the work is going to accumulate value over time. And that's where those little details, and where I'm such a stickler for the execution of artwork, that's another thing that they're looking for when they're looking at, at a work. It's how it's executed, it's how it's framed. And then I would say probably 
the, the third thing that they're looking for obviously is a connection to the piece. It has to mean something ultimately to them or to if they're purchasing it for somebody, it has to mean something to the, the person who will actually be on the receiving end of it. What are your thoughts on fear and creativity? Creativity is an exploration. So like any other adventure, Lewis and Clark style, going where nobody's gone before, there is definitely an element of risk and of fear. And courage could not be understated as really important. It's okay to be scared. Yeah. It's okay to be, be afraid. You um, always tell me that if, if you're not afraid, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong, <laughs> right, exactly. You have, to, you have to be able to challenge yourself. You have to be out of your comfort zone, and you have to have that fear and risk, but that's where the payoff is. About four years back, the actor Charlie Day did a commencement speech at Merrimack College. And it's something that ever since we it first went viral on the internet, it was something that we go back to all the time. We actually painted an image from that on our, on our wall, right over our work desk and our workspace, just to constantly remind ourselves of the one, one part of that speech where he talks and he says, and I'm paraphrasing, but he says, you don't have to be fearless, just don't let fear stop you. Now listen up. You cannot let a fear of failure or a fear of comparison or a fear of judgment stop you from doing what's going to make you great. You cannot succeed without this risk of failure. You cannot have a voice without the risk of criticism. And you cannot love without the risk of loss. You must go out and you must take these risks. And I don't think you should do just what makes you happy. I think you should do what makes you great. Do what's uncomfortable and scary and hard but pays off in the long run. Be willing to fail. Let yourself fail. Fail in the way, in the place where you would want to fail. Fail, pick yourself up and fail again. Because without this struggle, what is your success anyway? Look, as best we know it, we have one life. In it, you have to trust your own voice, your own ideas, your honesty, your vulnerability, and through this you will find your way. You do not have to be fearless. Just don't let fear stop you. And we go back to that continuously. We continue to remind ourselves of that. And it helps us, it helps us take those great leaps in life. And I think we've ended up in a lot of great places because we we took that leap. Back when we submitted to Coachella as artists, we had no background or framework for taking that leap. It was on a whim. We did it. And we didn't know what was going to come of it, but we knew the worst case scenario was nothing would yeah. come of it. And, that's an and so it could only go, go up from there. And because of that, we've had a great career and built kind of a name and a brand for ourselves. Uh, both here and in LA. So yeah, and just because you take risks doesn't mean you don't fall flat on your face and fail. Yeah, like that is absolutely part of risk. There's no way around that. You know, just because you're courageous doesn't mean you won't fall on your face in front of everybody, and they'll all point laughing. That's part of it. But if you can quantify the worst case scenario and you're okay with that, then you go. Fairy girls, like another one of my heroes, is like you know. You take a look at what your situation is, assess the risk. If you're ready for this, and this is the only way to do it, you have to fully commit. There's no, yeah. there's, you have to fully commit. That's it. You, but that's that's the rub. You can't, you can't kind of commit and have your way out. It's like if you're going to do this, you have to assess your fear, assess the worst case scenarios, and then fully commit. Yeah. And then what happens happens. And all of the artists that we've worked with that have made the transition from having a day job and working as an artist in their spare time to transitioning to working as a full-time professional artist, none of it happened overnight. They all went in with game plans. They all went in with three-year plans, five-year plans, so they could wean themselves off of their day jobs and start at the same time, allow themselves the time and to, to actually build a career and create work to get themselves out there. They promoted themselves. They, they, they took that leap, but it did take a, t a period of time. It wasn't Lots of little leaps. Yeah, lots of little leaps <laughs> yeah. together. And every leap was always scary. They all had that moment where when they finally did step away from their job, it was, oh, oh, I'm, I did this. I right. now 
I, some, of, some of them have even said it's, they work more and they work harder and they worry more now because they're working as full-time artists, but that drives them and that, that dedication and they use that kind of fear and uncertainty of what tomorrow brings because then you're your own boss. And that's exciting and terrifying. And they use that to drive themselves forward every single day. They use that to make sure that they're posting on their social media and promoting themselves. They're using that to go out and into galleries, meeting with gallery owners, talking about shows, planning shows. All of that energy just goes right towards that. And that's what's making them successful as full-time artists. Email, show up, you know, it's, yeah, email. It's, it's, there's no mystery to it. Most um, galleries, uh, most galleries, if you go on their website, they'll have a way to submit, they'll have information. Um, I would always recommend artists start at the gallery's webpage, look for how to submit to that particular gallery, and follow that channel. Do not approach gallery owners on opening nights <laughs> or during artist receptions. Don't just bring your portfolio down during a show. That's the worst way to do it because then it already, you're kind of presenting yourselves as unprofessional. There's a reason that we put it on our website and have a tab devoted to submissions. And it's a form you can fill out. You can link it to, uh, you can link it to your work. And then those come in and then that gives us the opportunity to give our full undivided attention to going through each and every single one of them. So that, that would be my recommendation, yeah. is just go through the proper channels and normally the gallery will just outline and define that for you. You can find us at 9thegallery.com and that's the number nine. Um, our Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter handles all at 9thegallery. Just uh, yeah, go to your favorite search engine, type in 9thegallery. We're there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carrie Beth and Sean. I love what you said about fear and the people that you referenced. And a lot of the things that you said about what an artist needs to do were things that I hadn't actually thought about before. So I learned so much from this interview as well. You can find Nine the Gallery in the description below. Just like Sean said, you can't throw a rock on Google and not find them. So definitely check them out. They always, always have something interesting going on. So there's probably an amazing exhibit opening, closing, or in the process right now. Do you own a gallery or know of a gallery that is super cool that should be spotlighted on Courageous Creatives? If you do, let me know in the comments below. Also, have you exhibited at Nine the Gallery in any shows coming up or in the past? What are your thoughts on Nine the Gallery? Are you a fan? If you are, put that in the comments below as well. As always, subscribe for good times. I have videos every week related to creatives, creativity, interviews, advice, tech tips, all kinds of fun things. I have two videos related to Nine the Gallery, the decked time-lapse videos, which are amazing. You can see those over there, as well as a time-lapse from Alana Christine. She'll be showing in Nine the Gallery down the road, and she was also in that decked show with me check out her video as well. And remember, if you are a creative or artist trying to make it and overcome your fears, you, you are, are courageous. courageous.